Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help you thrive as a cyber risk manager. On today's episode, your virtual chief information security officer is Kip Boyle, and your virtual cybersecurity counsel is Jake Bernstein. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. So, Kip, what are we going to talk about today? Hey, Jake, welcome to uh, the next episode. And today what we're going to do is we're going to learn about a, uh, a cool thing called the Essential Eight. But no, it's not, a, it's not a new superhero group. But I believe the Essential Eight has what I think of as heroic potential for cyber risk managers. So there you go. Well, that sounds great. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad we're not talking about uh, the Sinister Six. Uh, <laughs> that's a little different. Um, doesn't sound like there's going to be a new MCU movie about the Essential Eight. Uh, although, uh, you know what? That would if, be cool. Although, if you take the Fantastic Four and multiply them by two, you do get the you would get the Essential Eight. Um, <laughs> oh boy, we better be careful. Yeah, before we, we need get to be a careful. DCMA takedown notice. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, fair use. This is fair use, people. Um, yeah, fair use. <laughs> Okay, so um, well, anyway, I can't, I can't, uh, I don't have any control over whether this is going to become a movie. Although I do think it would be cool, um, but uh, but I have to confess that I did collect comic books prolific prolifically uh, when I was a kid, and I actually still have some of them in a in a box. So I mean, oh my gosh, I haven't looked at those things for years. I have some too, but just not very many. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, too much lore. Yep. Let's go on. Um, the Essential, Essential eight. eight. Right. So let me let me tell you a little bit about the Essential Eight. The idea behind them is, well, first of all, they're, they're mitigations, all right? They are technical mitigations. And the, the goal is to make it much harder for an adversary to compromise your systems when you have the Essential Eight installed and, and operating. Um, and... And the whole idea here in terms of business value is this. If you can get proactive and put the Essential 8 into your infrastructure, although it's going to cost time and energy and money, it's it's going to be more cost effective on in the long haul because you're not you're going to greatly reduce the chance that you're going to have to respond to a large scale cybersecurity incident. And as we've covered in previous episodes, and as anybody can discover by doing a quick Google search, the cost of a large-scale cybersecurity incident is extremely high. They never come at a convenient moment. So, so yeah, so that's kind of the idea behind these, and we're going to unpack them in this, in this episode. Now, when I talk to customers about the Essential 8, the way I try to, to put it in business terms is I say, look, these are cyber hygiene practices that you will uh, perform every day, s multiple times a day if necessary, uh, to greatly reduce the risk of malicious code infection. Now, the, the idea of, of being focused on reducing malicious code infection really depends on your threat model. What's nice about the Essential 8, and we're going to cover them one by one in a moment, is that depending on what your threat model is, you can implement them in different orders and at different maturity levels. So you get a lot of flexibility. So if if ransomware, for example, is your is your big concern, and it is for a lot of people today, and it should be, then there's a particular order that you can uh, implement the essential eight. But if your threat model is somebody stealing your intellectual property because that's the heart of your company, if you're say a biotech or something like that, then then there's a different order that you would put them into, and there's guidance about how to do that. And so anyway. Prioritization, man. That's what it's all about. Yes, I do know how you love prioritization uh, for <laughs> sure. And I think what's really interesting about the Essential Eight is, uh, you know, the the concept of reasonable cybersecurity really is going to come into play in this episode. I mean, this is primarily a technical episode, uh, but keep in mind that whenever we talk about technical controls like this, it is always going to be part of a overall cyber risk management strategy, um, and this, you know, even the name kind of evokes this concept of, gosh, if you aren't doing these, then, you know, you're kind of leaving a lot on the table, which maybe you shouldn't leave on the table. So I think it's well, pretty what I've uh, noticed, interesting. 
Yeah, what I've noticed is a lot of people are pursuing uh, the Center for Internet Security, you know, top 20 uh, uh, critical controls, right? That comes up over and over and over again in conversation. And so that seems to be the, de- the de- uh, you know, the de facto standard, um, you know, when people start thinking about, um, you know, what, what should I be doing from a technical perspective to, to protect myself? And I, I actually think, and we can, we can talk about this in a separate episode, we can go more deeply, but the critical security controls uh, as they exist now uh, came into being quite some time ago. And, and I think two things. One is they're, they're really not reasonable for a mid-sized or a small company or a startup. They're only reasonable for a large enterprise uh, and that's really the context from when, from where they came. And the other thing I believe is that um, is that they are antiquated. I, I really don't think that they're the best choice. I don't think they're the number one choice. If you're trying to um, deal with malicious code attacks, I, I just I don't think that that's the best choice anymore. And this episode is to is really designed to tell you why uh, I think the Essential Eight is your best choice. There's a lot of overlap, but I like the essential eight for a number of reasons. Num- number one, there's only eight of them as opposed to 20. Um, and, and the prioritization I think is better and it has flexibility of prioritization. The, uh, the critical security controls uh, kind of comes in its own prioritization. And the last time I looked at it, there wasn't a lot, I mean, you could reorder it any way you like, but there really wasn't any guidance about, you know, how you should do it uh, and under what circumstances. So in any event, um, so, since I love to be ruthless about prioritization, uh, I love this episode. Yeah, and and now you know. So obviously, the the CIS top twenty, the CSC, they those come from the Center for Internet Security, as you mentioned. Where well, they came from the SANS organization That's originally, true. and then originally. and then SANS gave them over to the Center for Internet Security for care and feeding and and maintenance. So where does the Essential Eight come from? So the Essential Eight is a relatively new framework and it comes from our friends in Australia. Um, they have an organization which is roughly equivalent to the American National Security Agency. So the spooks, right? The people who do all the clandestine uh, computing in the United States, both in terms of code breaking and code making. So the Australian Signals Directorate or the ASD, that's where the essentially comes from. And and it was designed very specifically to deal with the problem that they were facing, which was, um, you know, endless attacks by criminals and nation state actors with the primary goal of getting some form of malicious code on your computer. Because almost every cyber attack starts with dropping a piece of malicious code on your computer. Now, there's there's some that don't, but I think the most prolific ones do I think about not Petya, for example? I mean, that was the delivery of a malicious code. Well, Wanna and, cry, right? Some of the biggest, yeah. baddest, you know, compromises have had to do with malicious code. And just to clarify, you know, we often will we've said the statistic repeatedly that that most attacks start with phishing. But what we sh- what we should clarify is that many of those phishing attacks are the goal is to install something on your machine, which takes us right into this malicious code concept. So right. it's some th- phishing attacks are designed to, you know, dupe you into moving money. And the essential eight isn't going to do a lot to help you with no. that. But by but the vast majority are designed to get malicious code. And on. I would say, and you know, and let's talk about this briefly. You know, there's also the the classic phishing attack, which is just trying to get you know credentials, and and the essential eight aren't going to stop um, you know credential social engineering attacks. But I would say that um, certainly from a, from a technical security perspective, uh, malicious code execution is probably one of the most dangerous um, events that you can have happen. And so when we 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 really think that this is these essential eight can be used to to really mitigate greatly the risk of, of malicious code running on your hardware. And that is that's really going to help a lot. 
Oh my gosh, yes. Because a lot of malicious code is silent. You get it on your machine and you have no idea that it's there. They don't want you to know um, until they want you to know. So like ransomware, the research shows that that a typical ransomware attack against an organization is actually uh, has actually been in progress for several months before the victims actually see the screens demanding the ransom. Um, so uh, a remote uh, keystroke logger, a remote access Trojan, um, you know, different ways of getting into the organization and establishing a persistent um, uh, silent access is is a uh, is a you know is a prerequisite to a lot of these attacks. The Equifax breach. It was documented that that uh, you know that people broke in and then established a foothold uh, from from which they could operate. That way, if one machine is patched and you lose it, you've got others that you can use as as backup. But but to go back to the origin, so the Australian Signals Directorate said, oh my goodness, look at all this malicious code coming at us. We've really got to come up with something that's going to specifically uh, deal with this and, and other things too. But I love how they got so practical with it. And, 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 you know, and, and one of the things that's in there is multi-factor authentication. So even if you get phished and they steal your user ID and password, if you've got multi-factor authentication turned on as part of the Essential 8, not much can be done with those credentials that that were just stolen. That is often true. Okay, so um, what are they? What are, list the let's list the essential eight, and then we can talk about them. Okay, great. So here here you go, and I'm and this is the implementation order to guard against ransomware and malicious code. The first thing is offline backups of your data. The second is application whitelisting. The third is you need to patch your applications on an ongoing basis. The fourth is you need to restrict the execution of Microsoft Office macros. Number five is you have to harden your web browser against attacks having to do with active content and um, uh, advertisements, things like that. Uh, number six is you have to restrict administrative privileges as much as possible. Number seven, you need to patch your operating systems. And number eight is multi-factor authentication. So that's the eight. Okay, and I'm so, thinking of each one of them with their long flowing hair and capes. Yeah, yeah. So let's, uh, or in the Fantastic Fourth case, there are no capes. Mm. Um, That's right. Yeah, Edna, Edna Mode is very much against capes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> okay, so should we take a brief look at each one um, well, and, and see what we can let's do. do? Okay. Um, <laughs> I know how much you like them, and I, and I know that I had to actually talk you out of doing a single podcast episode out of each one, I think. I think everyone now is very thankful for my um, my my work on talking yes, about you've that. Yes, you've arrested me. I'm guilty as charged. I can't help but to play um, the lawyer uh, lingo here. But I don't know. I mean, I may I may take another run at it one day, especially if we get some listener feedback that says, "Yeah, yeah let's, maybe they will." You know, let's let's check it out. Okay, so are you ready to go through each one in turn? And I will I will be very I'll be very brief. I'll give enough, and then if you have any questions, ask me. Sure, uh, I'm going to start with offline backups. And I, and I want to say that this one is, is really important. Uh, and the reason is, is that I've actually seen this matter. Uh, I'm sure you, we both have. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the safety shoot on your rocket ship, right? If anything goes wrong, your crew capsule can be uh, detached and you can safely float back to Earth. So, I mean, you can try to prevent a lot of things from going wrong. And the, the backup, the data backup mitigation is going to be your safety. No, no, hold on. I do have a question though. Why offline backup? I mean, isn't, isn't that kind of going back in time to a, a more primitive mm -hmm. era? It is. Yeah. But offline backups don't mean we actually have to go back to magnetic tape and manual uh, tape uh, swaps. Uh, there's other ways to do it. But yeah, so the idea here is that um, the adversary is making a lot of money right now, in case anybody didn't realize that. Uh, ransomware is a boon for attackers. They're making billions of dollars. And guess what? Um, there's only so many yachts and pinky rings that the criminals uh, can probably buy before they get sick of that. And so they actually allocate most of their um, ill-gotten gains to uh, increasing the effectiveness of their code. And we've actually watched ransomware improve over time. In the beginning, ransomware completely disregarded shadow copies, you know, back online backups and all that stuff. But over time, as they realized that that um, that a, a data backup could you know prevent them from getting paid, they've actually been increasing the effectiveness of their ransomware to, to first locate backups, encrypt them, then to encrypt the actively used data and then show you a notice. So you think you're covered, you go to your online backups, but then you find, nope, uh, 
they've already been encrypted. And so they're of no use to you at all. And so we're talking about air gaps now, right? I mean, because if the malicious code can, can find out that you've mapped a drive or that you've got, you know, any kind of, uh, of a file share in order to facilitate backups, then, then it's going to uh, get on there and it's going to compromise you. Yeah. And I want to be very clear about what, what offline in this case means. It doesn't just mean using uh, like network attack, network attached storage instead of a cloud service. I mean, obviously, auto backing up is very convenient. And it's nice and easy and it happens in the background. And, and there's all kinds of services from dedicated backup solutions to, uh, you know, kind of standard cloud storage. Uh, but even a local network uh, kind of semi old school uh, backup solution is vulnerable to this type of attack. And so when we say offline, we mean air gapped, not connected. Um, unavailable unless there is a physical person doing something. And, yeah. Uh, and there that's has to be really, a little bit of manual, yeah, manual intervention. There yeah. really does. That's, it's really important because let's be clear, if, if, if software can find it, then the ransomware bad guys can find it. So, Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and the algorithms for finding it are pretty good. Because why? Because I will bet you that the adversary has a fully functional, fully implemented copy of every mainstream data backup solution that is commercially available. And they have tested their malware with every one of them. Definitely. So so if you think that this is just, you know, well, you know, they'll never figure out my particular way of doing things because yes, I've they obfuscated it. Yes, yeah, they're they going to find it. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a that's a that's a common security fallacy is a, uh, security by obscurity. Yeah. By itself, that is not helpful. You have to combine it with with other strategies. But OK, so there's there's offline backups. Right. So, again, the idea is if everything else goes wrong, at least you've got these and you should have multiple backups types of backups. By the way, you can have backups that are quick restore for like, oops, I deleted the file. But that, but you ultimately have to have some kind of an offline backup too. So um, go to your backup vendor that you're using and say, look, I want to make sure we're ransomware resistant and this, get them to tell you how to configure yourself and, yep. and do it. I mean, just do it. Okay, number two, application whitelisting. Now, the uh, these next one, two, three, four uh, controls are, are all clustered under the category of preventing malware delivery and execution. The last three that we're going to look at are really designed to limit the extent of a cybersecurity incident should something get through anyway. And that's the thing. I mean, there is, there's no perfect security here. So even if you do these flawlessly, the adversary still might get through. So there's some things that we can do. Well, and, and that's, why, that's why defense in depth is never going away. It's, it's, that's just a core part of any security uh, strategy. Uh, and it's and it's you know it's it's just very very basic. It goes to the the core of any kind of situation like this, where you need to have the the kind of layers of the onion approach to security. Yep. So so that's belt why. and suspenders, as we say yep. sometimes. But let's talk about application whitelisting. It's sometimes referred to as application control because some, because for some reason when when I say application whitelisting, I see a lot of sysadmins roll their eyes and get jittery um, because they are fearful of of the massive administrative headache. And I get that. But there's ways to do it which are not nearly as difficult. For example, don't use file hashing and don't use certificates. You can just use uh, uh, you can just restrict execution based on on folder path, um, and and actually that's extremely good these days. So um, so don't get crazy with it. And we've actually done some whitelisting uh, work with our customers, and so we've we've at, we've we've seen what works, we've seen what doesn't, and yes, there will be some additional work here to be clear, but the, the value is, is tremendous. I mean, think about it. Even if a piece of malicious code could be delivered successfully to your computer, it, it would be a dud. It, it couldn't do anything. It would not be allowed to, to execute by the OS. I mean, and, and how wonderful, because you don't have to rely on a signature from an antivirus vendor. You don't have to rely on behavioral analysis, which may or may not work. It's really simple. Is this thing on the list of approved stuff? No. Denied. Can't run. Uh, it's so powerful. So that's number two. Okay. Okay. Uh, essential number three is patching your applications. I see a lot of people struggle with this because when 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 this control says applications, it really means everything, not just Microsoft Office, which is kind of one of the Actually, easiest things to patch. 
can I interrupt? I, I, yeah. I, I actually, I, I just had a thought. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go back. Is it okay if I go back one? You want to go back to whitelisting? Just, just briefly. Yeah. Okay. So all right. Do it. One of the things about whitelisting. So something you said kind of, it, it was, it was percolating in my mind. You said, you know, we can do uh, path restrictions and there's different ways of doing it. Uh, and I just thought to myself, you know, if you can restrict by path, then, you know, why aren't the bad guys going to figure that out and just put their malware in the most likely path that's going to be allowed to run? That's entirely possible. And that's why I say these things are not uh, uh, foolproof. But here's the thing. Um, I know that cyber criminals are, are essentially looking for the lowest hanging fruit possible. If you make their jobs just the slightest bit more complicated, There's a great chance that unless you're targeted, unless you have something very specific that they want, but if they're just opportunists, they're just going to go, ah, forget this place. Because there's so many other people not doing this. There's so many easier targets. And so there's a lot of value in just making yourself a harder target. There are. And the other thing about the application whitelisting is that just because it is uh, might be difficult and in some cases a speed bump as, as opposed to an absolute brick wall um, mm-hmm. it's adds another layer to that onion yes um, and yeah. that is critical and and you know the other thing to consider is oh I know you're probably IT people in particular are thinking oh man you know my users are gonna get up in my business about this they're gonna you know yell at me for restricting yeah. apps here's the thing if it's a corporate asset, they don't get to decide what code gets to run on that machine. And uh, so so even this, which is a very technical you know, mitigation and control, also involves people and processes and management. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, you know, the era of discretionary do what you want on the company computer, I think, is coming to a close. It really needs to. I was talking to a customer who had a warehouse and I was trying to explain this idea to him. And he said, well, you know, I, I just don't get it. Why should I even bother caring about what people put on these computers if it's going to make them happy or more productive? Like, shouldn't I want that? And I said, well, let's talk about your warehouse. I go, what would you think if your employees in the warehouse had a down moment and they said, you know, let's drag race these uh, forklifts. You know, hey, I'll get in one, you get in one. Let's see how fast we can get these things going. I mean, you would never tolerate that. You would never uh, allow that because you know that the consequences are serious. You know, if somebody gets hurt, uh, you know, a, a shelving unit gets knocked over, whatever, and you'd never do that, right? So an, an, a company asset has an authorized use and you restrict it to that. And I said, you really need to get to that place with your computers. Yep. And that's what the authorized use policy is for. Yeah. Okay. We don't have a lot of time, so we need to keep going. Let's go. So let's return to patch applications. Now it's easy to patch Microsoft Office, which is great, but we need to patch everything else, especially um, like our Adobe products, um, our web browsers. um, You know, if you have vertical applications, we, we really need to patch everything. And so you probably are already patching applications, but you need to build on that. You need to get more and more of your critical applications into your patching uh, regime. And why? Well, because vulnerabilities in applications emerge all the time, and they're a common uh, path to executing malicious code on on systems. In, in fact, unfortunately, that's, that's what happened with NotPetya, was um, the... The vendor of a piece of software got compromised. A piece of malicious code got stuck into a, a patch that looked legit. The patch was distributed to all the users. And so the adversary actually hijacked a patching function in order to deliver their malicious code. So, yikes. And again, layer of the onion approach. Defensive yeah. Match. Okay, so restored to Microsoft Office macros. This is easy. Um, oh, you skipped. No, you didn't. No, you I got didn't. It right. I didn't skip anything. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Restricting Microsoft Office macros, you know, these are kind of legacy features. And I and I think increasingly they don't play much of a future. Um, I'm sorry, they don't play a role in the future of of even Microsoft Office as they have declared um, in, you know, going forward, just because they have all sorts of different mechanisms coming more on more online, more more um, collaborative software. So these really are a, a legacy issue. And I think because of that, you know, the odds of an IT, you know, modern IT professional 
getting a user who says specifically, hey, enable Microsoft Office macros are pretty low. And if someone does that for some business critical you know, piece of, of, of workflow, that's fine. You can address that then. But just by turning them off, you protect your entire organization against a fairly simple kind of exploit. So... And, and a well-trod path to getting malicious code into your yep. into your environment. So, um, and that's the thing about the ASD is they they actually studied how does malicious code typically get into an environment. They looked at how criminals and attackers are actually doing it, and this is one of the the main delivery mechanisms, and that's why this is on the list. Yep. Okay. Uh, number five: web browser hardening. Yeah, web browser hardening. Um, so I've changed the name of this a little bit. Um, in in the standard, you'll see it called user application hardening, but that's it's a little deceptive. I don't really like that label because really what they're talking about when you read this control is they're talking about the web browsers and the fact that you historically have had uh, a way to do active content like Flash, uh, Java, and and then advertisements. Um, and then different um, different data sharing uh, things like um, Olay, which which became ActiveX, um, PDF viewers. I mean, there's just all this functionality. I mean, web browsers have really become a new operating system, right? That's not a that's not a new concept. We've been hearing about that for some time. I mean, look look at Chromebooks, right? It's you know Chrome has become the OS, um, and so guess what? And it, it just it's bristling with all these features and um, and and. And web browsers can actually talk directly to USB devices in some cases. So, um, so you've got to harden this stuff. And I want to take a moment and talk specifically about advertisements. So, uh, ad blockers are available, and ad blockers are, have come from a philosophical stance against uh, intrusive advertisements that slow down computers and distract you from what you're trying to do. And um, now, on the other side of that, though, all these websites that we enjoy have to raise revenue somehow, and typically they're they're selling ads, and and I'm sympathetic to that. The, and I'm not trying to suggest that that's really the security issue here. The security issue here is that most websites have no control over which ads are displayed. They allocate space and then they uh, hand over uh, ad display to a completely different company. And what I've noticed is that ad the servers that typically serve up ads. Uh, are often a cesspool of malicious code. And even the best websites like Forbes.com a couple of summers ago for a couple of weeks uh, had the ads that were being served up were uh, chock full of malicious code. And, you know, and just, just loading that website, you didn't have to click a thing, uh, would put you at risk. So it's really necessary at work, I think, to restrict the execution of advertisements in your web browsers. Absolutely. Okay, number six, restrict administrative privileges. So we've just crossed over into a uh, the last kind of overall goal, which in this case is to limit the extent of cybersecurity incidents. And why don't you explain, Kip, how restricting administrative privileges can do that? Yeah, sure. So we all know that admin accounts uh, make the tech support burden lighter because people can just, you know, kind of self-serve and do what they need to do, whether it's install a new piece of software or, you know, adjust uh, the date and time or something like that. Um, and so, you know, so I think that's why admin accounts uh, in the hands of, of end users is a pretty common thing. But the problem is, is that when malicious code shows up on your computer, the authors of that malicious code assume that the person who invited it unwittingly, like a vampire, over the threshold onto their computer is an admin. And so the code executes with the same privileges of, as the user who actually brought the malware on the machine. So if the user's not an admin, guess what? Most of that malware is either not going to run or it's not going to run properly. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a great, it's a great barrier. Um, the other issue here, of course, is from a people process perspective. I mean, people are going to play with settings. Uh, it's inevitable and they might actually disable controls and make their overall machine more vulnerable than you realize. And then, so as the cyber risk manager, you're sitting there with a false sense of security. You think all this stuff's in place, but it's actually been taken apart brick by brick. And so, yeah, admin accounts should be severely restricted. Yeah. And the other thing is that if you do restrict them, you also limit the ability of uh, enterprising uh, employees to uh, engage in shadow IT administration. Yeah. And, you know, shadow IT has some really wonderful um, aspects about it. 
Um, but it also has a lot of, a lot of, um, potential downsides too. So, um, so think hard about, about that. And, and, and the bottom line here is the, uh, this, the Australian signals directorate is saying, uh, admin accounts are the keys to the kingdom, ladies and gentlemen, and we do not want our adversaries to have those keys. Uh, patch operating systems, same idea. It's the same idea as patching, um, our applications, um, but based on ASD analysis, it uh, isn't the number one thing to prevent malware delivery and execution. Now, a lot of people in in my line of work would be like, "Oh, that's BS!" Like patching applications, or sorry, patching operating systems. Like that's top. That's top of the list. Like that's we should do that before we harden our web browsers. And and I think what they're missing is the fact that the battle. The cyber battles that are being fought these days are happening on the desktop. They're not happening on the network so much. Like nobody's doing a frontal assault on a on a firewall or a server or any of that stuff. Now, if there's misconfigurations, sure, they'll take advantage of that. But but really what's what's going on is the adversary is fighting the battle on the desktop with phishing and they're trying to deliver malicious code there. And so you've got to put your focus on that in order to understand why these things in the order that they are in. And do you think that that also possibly it has to do with the fact that modern operating systems are are fairly auto patching these days? I mean, they do a much better job. It's different if you than set it was. Them up. If you set them up, yeah. Well, like Windows 10 out of the box is going to do that uh, for the most part. Yeah. Um, so in a, in a medium or small sized organization, right, you can just um, use a consumer grade version of Windows with auto patching and and it can just, you know, happen in the background. But I yep. know that bigger organizations are still, they're still gun shy about that. I understand because, you know, not every patch has um, you know, the, the, the quality that that's required to stay in business. But here's the thing I've done the research and the most cutting edge, uh, chief information security officers and the people who work on their teams are starting to realize something really important, which is the cost of unexpected downtime due to a flawed, uh, patch is, is a better risk than the cost of a massive security incident because you didn't push the patch fast enough. Absolutely. So okay. it's a no-win situation. It's the Kobayashi Maru of, of our career. I get it. But, um, you know, you, you, need to, you need to make a choice. Like, you, you can't have, you can't, I don't know how to have it, I don't know how to have it both ways. No, I don't either. Okay, multi-factor authentication. This one we've talked about many times. Let's run through it real fast so we can wrap up before going too far over yeah. our, our time limit. Okay, so what you want is multi-factor authentication everywhere. Now, you don't just flip a switch and, and turn it on everywhere. You've got to be, um, you know, you've got to take it in steps. But but let's talk about, you know, um, VPNs. It, it needs to be there. Remote desktop protocol, secure shell, any, any kind of remote access uh, that you have, no matter what it is, you really need to have multi-factor authentication on it because if somebody grabs credentials, and by the way, there are billions of compromised credentials available on the internet to uh, to stuff into automated uh, compromise machines. So um, you know the fact that that we have so many credentials uh, available on the internet has really made uh, multi-factor authentication necessary because. I mean, really, how likely is it that I'm going to think up of a of a new uh, user ID and password combination that isn't already out there somewhere? I mean, well, if you use a password, know, if you use a password manager, pretty good. It, well, it's going to help, right? But the thing is, is that password management adoption isn't where it needs to be. No, I agreed. And and also, I think in a in a structured company setting. Um, you know, you can give people a password manager and you can say you should use it and you can train them and you can monitor them and you can cajole them and blah, 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 blah. You can fire them for not using it. <laughs> you can you can dismiss them for not using uh, it. You can do a lot of things. That might but, be that but, might be extreme, Kip. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I'm just saying uh, what my point here is, is that uh, is that is that password managers are very people intensive thing to administer, but multi-factor authentication is way simpler. You, you set it up, you, you know, you train people. I mean, there's still, there's still a human factor here, but once people settle down with it, um, you know, it, it's much less likely to go wrong or to be used badly. That's still an issue of course, but, um, but multi-factor authentication really does a nice job of making the fact that all these billions of, of credentials are freely available on the internet irrelevant. And that's what I love about it is you want to make these kinds of things irrelevant. And let's go back to application whitelisting for a moment. The fact that people are clicking on phishing links and downloading malicious code 
I, I am done with this idea that we're going to train our way out of that, right? And I, I now we should probably still train people, right? About you know if they click on a, a, a test fish, you know we should tell them, hey, you, you know you, you clicked on a test fish, but we really need to make clicking on links, malicious links, irrelevant. It's like you clicked on it, whatever. I've got I've got an application whitelisting. I've got the essential eight. It, it doesn't matter. Well, and and it it goes back to the the defense in depth, you know, layers of the onion concept. Here, here's the thing: is that all. Ultimately, we're playing a numbers game, and we've often said, uh, even if not on this podcast, that the the extreme difficulty faced by defenders is that defenders have to be right 100% of the time, whereas the attacker only has to be right one time. And, you know, there is, there is it's essentially impossible to get 100% of any group of people to not do something or to do something. That's right. So yeah. when, when you say, when you say we're not going to train our way out of it, that's not saying that we shouldn't continue to train because obviously, Correct. you know, if we stop training and suddenly 50% of our employees are, are, are <clears throat> busily clicking on phishing links, well, that's just going to increase the odds that something gets through. So we, we still train, but the point is that, is that you have to have me- mechanisms because we know that, no single mechanism will be will be foolproof. That's right. That's right. And even the statistics released by the training companies themselves, go pull their latest uh, reports, and you'll see that um, that they can get the uh, the rate of clicking on malicious codes, you know, down from you know say eighteen percent down to three percent or two percent or even one percent. But you know that just that just emphasizes your point that okay, one percent is still an acceptable rate of of compromise for an attacker. <laughs> oh, it's great. I mean, think of it this way. If you have if you have a 10,000 employee company, which would be, you know, that's solidly in the enterprise space, but you know, 10,000 employees, 10 or 1% of 10,000 is still is it 100? I think it's 100. Um yeah, it's still I mean, 100 wow, people and, you know, that is hey, more than happy I to mean, take that type of I mean, uh, think about spam, right? Spam selling uh off off brand or black market Viagra or whatever. They all they need is a uh, a response rate of like one half of one percent or one third of one percent. Yeah, and they are making profit again. It's, so it's, it's a numbers game. It is a numbers game. So all right, so that takes us to the end of uh, of the essential eight, and I just want to close with a couple more thoughts. One of them is is that I I continue to see articles on social media magazines saying like, hey, we got to get back to the basics, right? And 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 I really agree with that because here's the thing: expertise is, I think, defined by a mastery of the basics. And my my assertion here is that the essential eight are the new basics for protecting your company. And I believe you need to master these before you start um, getting uh, interested in esoteric stuff. Um, you know, machine learning, AI, whatever, whatever. You know, if you don't have these things under control, then then I, you know, you really need to question whether you know whether you should be messing around, uh, you know, with with other things. So uh, don't let your onion have a hollow core. <laughs> Ogres don't have hollow cores, so your onion shouldn't either. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> okay, Shrek reference for anybody who didn't get that. Sorry. Okay, Jake, that's my closing thought. Do you have a closing thought other than hollow onions? I do not. Let's go, okay. let's go ahead and close the episode. Let's leave it on hollow onions then. So that wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. And today we did a quick review of the essential eight mitigations. You should reach out to us if you have more questions because there's so much more to say, but we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport, so include your senior decision makers, legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. So if you want to manage cyber as the dynamic business risk it has become, we can help. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.